our first speaker, who is Dean Johnson. He's the head of innovation at Brand Width Group. Dean does lots of stuff. Most of it is pretty interesting. Uh, he once included me in the lyrics of a rather peculiar rap battle he had with himself. Absolutely true. Um, when he's not doing that, he's head of innovation at Brandwith, where he's shaping the connected future for automotive, publishing, music, film, education, and leisure clients. He's also a writer, presenter, and BBC tech pundit. And to top off all of that, he's a fellow and former VP of the Chartered Society of Designers and a mentor for the British Fashion Council, although you could never guess that from the outfit he's wearing today. So he's going to be taking us through the state and the future of VR. Please, would you welcome Dean Johnson. Thanks, Dave. The rap battle, yes, it's all true. There's none of that today. Actually, no, there is a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, right, now, what I wanted to do today was give you a, a little bit of a walkthrough. Uh, it's not going to be about the tech. It's not going to be about how you should do this, how it should happen, but it's going to be about where we are, how we got here, and you know, a real vision for the future. Um, so this is me. This is me with a variety of gadgets, a variety of virtual gadgets. I do have the luxury of traveling the world and actually getting hands-on with these things. Uh, and that's uh, the beauty of that for our clients is that they get first dibs, get to see what's good, what's bad, what's useful. Um, and the benefit for you guys is that it can't always be here. I mean, the beauty of a, a virtual world is fascinating when you put a headset on, but actually, you need to put the headset on to do that. So great stuff from Sony and HTC and Nokia and, in the corner here, The Void, which we'll come to a little bit more in a, in a, in a moment. Um, but Brownwith as a company, we've had, bizarrely, we've had 17 years of virtual reality experience, um, right back into the dark days of massive, clumsy plastic things that you put on your head. Um, through some incredible journeys here, from Star Wars to Doctor Who, to placing people on planet surfaces and exploring amazing exoplanets, and for the music business, actually placing people in, in the centre of the action. Um, but... You know, this is for an incredible collection of clients, and they're, you know, they're all very forward-thinking, and you know, as you will all know, there's so much potential, particularly for the big brands that really, really want to make a splash uh, with something that is very much now. Um, now, as we can see here, this was something that I, on the same presentation that Dave had to put up with, sound, sound. <laughs> This was a uh, on, VR lightsaber battle with myself, which didn't end quite as planned, uh, and Dave had to come and prod me with his foot at the end, unfortunately. Um, now, talking of unplanned, also in Poland last year, uh, we had an unfortunate incident of Vader porn, um, where I was controlling a lightsaber with my phone. The phone didn't work, so the only thing I could do was use cursor keys for a lightsaber battle, which is not ideal. And in moving forward, uh, my lightsaber disappeared into Darth Vader's groin, um, which was not exactly as planned. Um, so, all of the other exciting things that we do at Brandwith, I can't tell you about. Essentially, I'm not really here to tell you about Brandwith, other than to say it's all amazing, it's great, it's going to make waves, it's going to hit, you know, really impact. But I can't talk about it. So, what can I talk about? Um, virtual statistics. So. Now, let's look at the business in general. So, you know, creative industries, £9.6 million pounds an hour. Uh, clearly, we've not got our billing exactly as it should be, because that sounds like we should be making a lot more money. Um, but what's that worth? You know, that's £84.1 billion pound a year. And, you know, to use a phrase not particularly English, that's freaking awesome. That is amazing. That's creativity. And that's what we're here to talk about these two days about content about amazing creative content. And, you know, these devices are fabulous, but they are empty vessels without amazing content in them. So, looking at more stats, look, we got 500 million pounds worth of investment um, last year. Now, you know, that's still small money at the moment. Um, until you look at, last week, another 550 million in one week in Magic Leap. So this is augmented reality, virtual reality. We're here to talk about more these two days, but augmented reality, Big player. So, I mean, Google Cardboard, great statistics here for, for our lowest common denominator. This is our target market. This is the broadest market we've got at our, at our disposal. So, 5 million Google Cardboard already shipped. 25 million installs of, of content on that. So, people are genuinely curious. You know, those VR virgins out there, 
you know, get this, get your heads into pieces of cardboard and just, you know, immerse yourselves. 350,000 hours of YouTube videos already being viewed. Uh, and then, and I mean, the great statistic at the bottom there is, is half a million students took global field trips. So this, you know, this is fabulous stuff, and, and I will get on to more about that later. So the potential is huge, Look, we, you know, genuinely huge. Um, we wouldn't all be here, you know, our curiosity peaked and the fact that some of us were already making this stuff um, if it wasn't relevant. So hundred billion pounds by 2020. You know, these are figures not necessarily entirely plucked out of the air. However, um, there's been a report recently, you know, DigiCapital, great report. However, I, I think their splits are really, really skewed because they've essentially said, you know, that there's a, a percentage of that is VR and a massive percentage is augmented reality. Now, augmented is easy to put on your head and you're there in your own room. However, they've kind of lumped in mobile handsets with that. Now, we all know, I've already talked about Google Cardboard, those handsets are going to be creating and producing virtual reality. So that is a, that's our all-encompassing VR and AR stats, 100 billion pounds. Um, so I'd like to highlight some of the, the real good work that's been done, you know, the last 12, six months. And top left, we've got The Martian, fabulous stuff, great stuff from a, you know, a real collection of partners there from Third Floor and uh, Framestore VR and, and VRC, working with 20th Century Fox to create something that, with a visionary director, so you've got, you know, you're looking at something that's using the film footage, using the content, and genuinely adding an experience to something that is, you know, a, a great film. Um, but it's not trying to be that film, it's trying to give you something you couldn't get from that. Uh, and then over in the corner here, we've got Ford and Castrol taking, you know, brilliant experience here. Not something, so this is an interesting spin. This is a piece of PR, essentially. So you've got a driver driving around a virtual track, but in reality, he is driving a car. What he sees is some incredible virtual environment. Um, now, that, you know, that's a great spin for PR. You know, we're not able to sit in that car and experience the same thing. However, it's, it's a great way to show that that kind of entertainment value will be accessible to us in the future. Uh, and then you look over here and, you know, for the, for the Dali Museum, you know, fabulous ability to take people inside Salvador Dali's creations. Um, you know, what an opportunity. And there's some great stuff out there. So Van Gogh, um, you know, to take, you know, my daughters were fascinated by the fact that they could step into a painting and into that world. Um, and again, I'll come on to the fact that, you know, that's a real level of engagement for education that gives us an opportunity to, you know, engage kids in a way that they wouldn't necessarily have been. And then finally in this corner here, we've got um, something that was announced recently, the, the virtual reality ghost train experience. Um, good old Darren Brown, he's got involved in this and he's going to scare the crap out of you all by putting you in a virtual environment um, and seeming to have all sorts of incredible scary crap going on around you. Um, you know, amazing stuff. But, you know, two that I wanted to pick out in particular for the last year. Um, so we've got Land's End over here. Great stuff from us too. Um, so this was a Gear VR title. And look, I don't play puzzle games. I, I just don't. Uh, it's one of the, I waste my time in all sorts of other ways. But puzzle games is one thing that I just don't do. Uh, Christmas Day, downloaded this, was lost in it for however long it took me to go from beginning to end, solving everything, playing with everything, because they created an incredible world here. What they hadn't tried to do was create a replica of something that already existed. It was such a beautiful, stylized world that you, you felt as if you didn't actually want to come back out again. Um, and it felt, you know, you were genuinely solving puddles within a physical space. Obviously, it was still virtual. So great one there from us, too. But the highlight of the year would be The Void, so I was fortunate enough to go to Utah last year, and all of the all of the technology that we've seen so far, they're increments of of wonder. So we start off with that lowest common denominator, the Google Cardboard, your phone inside a piece of cardboard. That's great until you then step up a level. So you go for something, you know, even an enclosed headset that that it cuts out the light, but you move up to something like HTC Vive or PlayStation VR or Oculus Rift, and that becomes a different dimension. So suddenly you're moved up from, with Gear VR in the middle, that's still kind of central point, you're suddenly able to lean into content. You're suddenly able to have a virtual presence rather than be the observer and everything happening around you. Suddenly you're able to move in that environment. But then, you know, what happens if you're 
able to move beyond that kind of square of space, because you know, even with an HTC Vive, you eventually hit a virtual wall. The great thing that the guys at the Void have done is produce uh, a physical environment. So essentially, it's walls. Um, you put the headset on, and you start to move around this, this virtual world, you know, as, we're, as we're kind of used to seeing a virtual world, until you suddenly touch something. So you feel the wall that you see. Um, but as with most VR, the, you know, the wonder is, oh, I can look everywhere, I can do everything. But in the real world, you don't do that. I don't wander over here and suddenly touch the lectern. Uh, you just know it's there. So the same thing with, with a wall. You don't, initially, you do touch everything. But then you start to walk around, and it's as you brush, the, you're, as you're, you know, your shoulder brushes a wall, you suddenly go, I mean, I'm here. I am here, I'm grounded. Um, but what they've done, they've gone beyond that as well. So you walk past flaming torches in a kind of a... Indiana Jones temple environment, and you feel the heat of the torch as you walk past. Um, and then another vista opens up, and you look out across a jungle. But as it does, and the wall crumbles, the breeze comes in. So you, you've got this massive lump of plastic on your face, but you still feel the breeze. Um, and that's incredible. So you'd think that would be fine. But no, the next step on is they've got haptic vests. Um, so suddenly, the gun that you were holding that you could see in virtual reality and feel, but also when someone else shoots you, you feel that as well. Um, so the great thing as well is that you can interact with other humans in that environment. So we're used to that solitary experience at the moment with any of the other pieces of kit, but suddenly you take that step on and you go into the void with someone who you then talk to, who you then kind of tag team as you'd go around shooting giant alien spiders and all sorts of things. Um, but that makes that feel as if, you know, they're onto a winner because we all want to, you know, you feel as if you want to go back and repeat and repeat and repeat and better that experience. So anyway, enough on the void, but that's a, as for TED this year and in a few days' time, they're going to be revealing it to the wider world. Um, but of course, that reveals it to the, the evangelists who will go out and tell more and more people. So I'm here, you know, once you've done it, you'll be able to talk about it like I do. Um, so that's good stuff. But it's not good enough. Um, so the problem I have with VR at the moment is that it's a very inwardly focused industry. Um, we have a bunch of people that used to work in 360 video. And we're all talking about it. But the rest of the world actually isn't. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're convinced that everyone wants VR because everyone's tried it. Well, still very few people have tried it. And if they haven't tried it, they certainly don't want it. Um, so, it's our mission, stop looking in and start talking out, start telling everyone about how amazing this is. Don't just tell them, show them. Take those bits of cardboard, take whatever you have at your disposal to go and show people how amazing it is. Um, so 360 videos are not new. So we're already shooting little videos and posting them up and, you know, Facebook are doing a great job here because they're putting in line 360 videos that use an accelerometer that you can pan around as you see it in your, in your feed. That's not new stuff. 360 video has been around for years. Um, it's helping the message to a point for VR because people are going, hang on a minute, I can look around things. But you're, it's not VR um, because you're not in the environment. You're, and you know, even when you have a 360 video playing in a VR headset, there is no depth. There's no depth perception. You are not there. You are watching something. Now, the other thing that really irritates me, to the point of wishing people physical harm, is VR is not the future of the film. Now, it, it is a future. So this is, the, this is the example I would give here. We've worked with publishing for years, and when the iPad came along, you know, we were first to propose all the amazing things that could happen to the book. Now, people were quick to rush out and say, this is the future of the book. People will discard paper, they'll discard e-books, they'll discard all of that lot because this is so amazing. Why would we not just adopt this and ha forget about all that? That's just wrong. Because as far as VR is concerned, it's too expensive to produce every film as a VR movie. It's also, you know, it's incomprehensible for the audience because to sit through a two-hour blockbuster in VR, particularly with what we have at the moment, forget about what we have access to in the future, to do that is almost too mind-blowing. See, there's a lot of movies that you'll watch. I'm not going to sit there and watch Police Academy 4 in virtual reality. 
Um, there is so much that doesn't need to be done. There's, you know, there's, the focus should be on the amazing content. Now, this is one of our problems. Again, I was saying about us inwardly focused. Um, now, the film business would not be told what it should do by cameramen and sound technicians. Of course, the role of the cameraman and the sound technician is vital. However, the content drives that. So the visionary directors, the fabulous actors, that's got to be great content. But it is not the future for film. Um, so anyone that wants to have a conversation about that, try not to have too close a conversation, because I said I could get physically violent over the whole thing. Um, also, now this is, a, this is a tough one if you're a startup, if you're someone that I understand, you've been there, that every, every new piece of work that comes in, and, and everyone says, we need VR. It's a bit like when we were all talking about apps for the first time, and everyone said, oh, everyone, everyone's talking about apps, I need an app. You don't all need an app. Um, now, we went through this phase, and they kind of, kind of the balance is, is restored there. So now everyone's beginning to talk about VR, and say more industry-wide rather than consumers. So everyone's going, we need VR. You don't all need VR. Now, the problem here is, is the white noise and the saturation. If you saturate the market with everything being VR, and the first people that come to these things are experiencing a bad experience, it won't be long. Look, we've had the longest beta test in technological history here. For 24 months, people have been going, oh, VR, I'll try a headset on. That's amazing. Well, it's not amazing. Actually, that was rubbish, but it's all right. That's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll let you off. Now, we've finally got to the point where Oculus Rift is turning up, Gear VR is there, and consumers are getting their hands and their heads on this stuff. Now, what we do not want is for the first thing that they see and say is, fuck me, that VR is rubbish. I'm not doing that again. We want to make sure there's great content out there. So stop saying yes to everything. Um, now, this illustrates, if you're a VR startup, VR company, anyone at any level that's providing VR services, you need to have all of these boxes ticked. Now, that doesn't mean you need to produce all of them. It's about great partnership. So if you are the technician, if you're able to produce amazing content, but technically produce that. Don't start suddenly saying, but we know how to market that, and we know how to write and produce all of that content. If you're not a specialist in that, don't say that you are, because we're back to that level of crap again. Um, work with the people that really know what they're doing. Look, if you make the most amazing film, VR content in the world, but you don't know how to tell the world about it, it's the same as spending 100 grand on an app and then going, oh, no one bought it. It must have been crap. Always oh, forget these app things. No, it's because you didn't know how, where, when to tell people about it. So the interaction design and dev, if that's the requirement, make sure you know how to do that or you partner with someone that does. Marketing promotion, make sure you know how to tell the world about it. And then this you know, film, theatre and TV experience, this is not about just sticking a camera somewhere, unless it is that's all the content is. But if you're starting to tell stories with that, it's not about just putting a camera somewhere because they can see the wires down here, they can see that light, they can see a lectern over here. You need to know how to tell a new type of story and weave your audience through it. Um, you know, that isn't an experience that is just naturally picked up from someone that always used to produce 360 videos. Um, and the magic. So, you know, the magic is enthusiasm. It's the wish and the wonder to want to tell the world about how fucking amazing this is. Um, this, you know, we go to enough conferences where it's tech-based and it's telling people how to do stuff, and there will be some brilliant workshops about that. But we have gr a great opportunity here not to just go, well, it's an app that will tell you how warm your house is and I can open my garage door with it. Um, this is about um, incredible content um, and what that can do for you, what that incredible content can do, because... We've got a great opportunity here to produce stuff that, if you experience a website, if you experience an app, if you experience you know, any kind of current digital experience, that's something that you remember having experienced. Now, with virtual reality, we're creating memories. And when you put yourself in a VR headset, you remember being there. Now, there's so few things that allow us to do that other than actually being somewhere for that genuine experience. Now, digitally, we've got a fabulous opportunity. So, based on that, so 15 and 60s, you know, great time, big dreams, moon landings, you know, everything else that, you know, the thought was about, the, the thoughts for the future are going to be fabulous. 
you know, thinking really, really big, thinking about amazing opportunities. Um, and now the thing that irritates me is that we live in a land of iteration. I hate the word iteration anyway. Um, that's just because it's versions. Um, but we live in a world where, of course, we're driven by marketing. We're driven by sales. So we could have had one of those <laughs> back then. But no one would have bought all of these in between. So we need to be thinking about the leap from here to here. We need to be thinking about those big opportunities, the big ambitions. And we do genuinely owe the world some new dreams. You know, that great opportunity to say, look, kids, look, everyone, look. We, you know, essentially, we're a room full of adults, but we are all thinking like kids here. Look, I've got that sparkle in my eye because as a designer, you know, we've been constrained by desktop PCs that have had browsers, that have had plugins, that have had 72 DPI to expand to retina and, and apps, that, you know, fabulous visual content. Then suddenly our boundaries have broadened, you know, infinitely. So that's the level of dreaming and content we should be thinking of. So virtual future. So I've talked enough about what we're doing now. Um, there's lots of potential here. So I initially the future will mainly consist of VR hair. So, look at you over there, Dave. You don't have this problem, unfortunately. <laughs> so, the first thing anyone does, any of your demos here, any experiential piece in the middle of a shopping centre where you're trying to sit someone in a car, um, the first thing they'll do when they put this headset on is ruin their hairstyle. So, you've immediately got one reason to put off an audience. If they're passing through on their way to somewhere else where they actually want to look normal at the other end, we've got issues. That will pass. But, um, now I don't like to play videos in these things, but I will make that exception here because my two poor daughters get called upon uh, in numerous presentations that I give because they're so good at actually telling it like it is. Um, they'll quickly get bored with something that we think is fascinating. Um, and then they will say what it should be instead. So I'm going to hand over the screen to Olivia and Hattie. I want to fly, I want to swim, and I want to run really fast. What else would you like to do? Hover. Hover? Like on a hoverboard? Yeah. <sighs> so you could go back to the future? Yeah, and I want to have back to the future cars. You should make a game that when there's a book on the floor, and then you have to jump into it and it teleports you to the jungle and then a tribe comes up to you and they give you a book and then you put it on the floor and then you jump into it again and then it takes you to like space or a desert or somewhere else exciting or, or maybe like a medieval Castle. I would like to fly over the roofs with Mary Poppins and I would like to play with the Muppets and go on stage with them and go la 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 choo 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 and I would like to um, be a turn into a bat and fly it like in tri Hotel Transylvania and um, and be one of the two Ronnies you could also make a game where it's about phobia. So that you're in a so if you you have a phobia of the dark, um, you put the headset on, and it's and you're in a just in a really dark, spooky place, and then um and then like it it keeps on doing it. Um, and then like you do it like once or twice a day and then you get used to it and then like it, your phobia is gone and you could also do it where um, where it, you're in a till, no not a till, a lift and um, you're all squashed up with other people like claustrophobia and then there could also be one where you're in a basement and then um, there's if you're scared of rats and mice they're just like you hear them and then you just see one run in front of you and then like a rat and then a mouse and then they like one climbs up you and then you go nibble 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 and then you're like hello 
and then um and then there could be another one where you're in a you go into a shed and then it um and then there's spiders everywhere and then um you and then you you look down and then your um the player's hands are out and then like there's someone comes in and they put a tarantula on your hand and then you have to stay there and and look at it and then you do that for ages and then if you got a phobia of dead animals like me uh you could be walking through a forest and then you uh, see lots of dead animals and then you have to go up to it and poke it. I want them to be all clear white or whatever colour you want them to be then with big rubber spikes and little green diddy bobbers. I want these things to be a bit more exciting and furry and purple as wobbly things. So I think the message there is don't make good content, make great content. Because my two daughters, you know, Hattie will talk about anything. She will enthuse about almost anything. Um, books, um, films, pieces of string. Um, whereas Olivia, we always used to call her face when she wouldn't really kind of enthuse about anything, her Disney face. We took her to Disneyland Paris once and she went on every ride and every time she came off, she was like, and said, did you like that? Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that became her Disney face. Now, Virtual reality gives her the complete opposite of that. She will, as you could see there, she would, particularly about phobias, bizarrely. I think she wants to really scare the crap out of people to cure their phobias. But um, she will talk about it and enthuse about it because she can see, and this is why it's so important to look through their eyes, at that genuine opportunity to create something amazing. So, you know, don't make good content. Make great content, please. Please do. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. Now, a quick question for you. The, the, we've got the... You guys all know about the Gartner hype cycle. So it's when things... You've got this great big spike. You get the early adopters. You get the big spike. It becomes really popular, and then people start going, oh, I was into it before anyone else was into it. And, and it goes through this slump, and then it kind of goes up and it steadies out. And this is the Gartner hype cycle. Where is VR on that at the moment? So we're, we're kind of in that internal Gardner hype cycle. <laughs> <laughs> so we've spent, I say, 24 months going, it's amazing, it's amazing, it's amazing. Now, what we'll do, potentially, if you don't all do it properly, is we'll start to hit that dip as soon as the consumers get their hands on it. Yeah. Um, because we currently don't have the same way to hype things up. You, the might of Facebook with Oculus Rift they can still tell people how amazing it is, but if you haven't got it on your head, it still means nothing. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we're going we're gonna to go back up again, but we're, we're about to dip. We're about to go through a dip. All right, everyone get ready to be disappointed. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you very much.